right, take your Bibles, would you please, and look with me in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Music has an amazing way of taking us back to places, doesn't it? I remember the first time that I heard that song, that I remember hearing that song by a gentleman in my church that the Lord allowed me to grow up in. He would sing that song on occasion, and I remember loving that song very, very much. And over the years, I love it even more. What an amazing truth to ponder. And I'm glad today that we know of this love. And this is the very love that we speak of this morning and that we seek to see demonstrated in our lives through the working of the Holy Spirit. Last Sunday morning, we introduced this topic to you. I'll review for just a few moments and then we'll preach from this passage today, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and we'll begin. Father in heaven, now again, we desire to hear from you. We need your help. Lord, we ask that you'd bring our thoughts into captivity. And Lord, our hearts, that they would be subject to truth and that we would be attentive today, Lord, for that which you'd have for each of us. Lord, I believe that there's something here for all of God's people. This is certainly some, an area, Lord, that you would bring us along and develop us further in. We ask these things now in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Last week we gave you uh, the definition as much as we could of love through four different words. And I'll not belabor the point, but as a matter of review, we considered four Greek words. The first being the word eros, which speaks of self-love, a grasping or self-gratification. That is the basis of all words that deal with love. There was the word storgy that is used one time in the Bible, used in a negative sense, speaking of it in 2 Timothy 3.3, 3, saying that people would be without natural affection. And that love, uh, that presentation of love, is a family connection that deals with affiliation. Then there was uh, the love that is called phileo. It's from the same word that the city Philadelphia is formed from. It speaks of brotherly love. In other words, it speaks of friend to friend, or I, I like something about you, we have something in common. And we have this together, that friendship. And then we spoke of the greatest love or the greatest expression of love. And that is the Greek word that is used, the word agape, which speaks of God's love. I believe in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, they got it right because God's word is right. And they use the word charity because charity is a form of love, but it speaks of a giving love. Charity is a description of God's love. We know that God loved us. Why do we know this? Because he gave his son for us. God's love is a giving love. When you think of charity, you think of giving. And that's what this love is. It is a love that is based not on those that would receive it, but it is a love that is based on the giver. And I'm thankful today that we have a God who loves us. I'm thankful today, according to Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, in that while we were yet sinners, the Bible says Christ died for us. Romans 5, 8, but God commendeth his what? His love toward us. I thank God for Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20 where it says this, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And of course you're familiar with John chapter 3 and verse 16. The gospel of John deals with the love of God. It's in the Gospel of John chapter 13 and verses 34 and 35 where the Lord, as he was preparing his disciples for his departure, he spoke such things as this, a new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. Notice this, by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples if ye have love one to another. We, we sought to lay the groundwork for what love is. And then we use the illustration, the experience of love. I asked you last week to define a Corvette. And we know that there are things that could be listed and given about it. And then I said, would you rather experience one? And that's this thing with God's love. God's love can be defined and projected, but it is much as it is experienced. And it's shed abroad in our hearts. We gave illustration for that. We said last week that love is not the absence of truth. If you love someone, you speak the truth to them. Love is not the absence of discipline. If you love someone, you discipline them, you correct them. We looked together in 1 Corinthians and we saw that in this church that had many divisions and many issues and many problems that seemingly through their divisions and problems and pride, they'd become to make more of the gifts that they had been given than what God sought to accomplish through those gifts. 
And you see, when we make it about ourselves and not about God's work, when we make it about our own acceptance and or appreciation by others, then we really begin to render ourselves useless. And he described their gifts, and we could go and put more time in that, but we'll not. And he said that even if you had these gifts, which are not bad gifts, and it's good to want God to gift us or to talent us to further his work, it's okay to desire those things, but without love, what's the sense in them? And I left you last Sunday morning with three things to consider. My mouth, my mind, and my motive. If I communicate in such a way, in an eloquent way, but I have not love, that I've become as what? A tinkling cymbal and sounding brass. I've become noise. I gave you the illustration that I would rather have someone who has the love of God and knows the love of God and shares the love of God who communicates maybe in a simpler form than a person with eloquent, swelling words and great speech, but does not demonstrate, experience themselves, or even hand out the love of God. People need to know truth, but they need to hear it from a person who loves God and loves them. I think that one of the areas that we are failing generationally is we have allowed the definition of love to be hijacked. And we say love is, and, but God is telling you through a letter that is a letter of correction, God is giving you the definition and an experience or an expression of love, trying to help you to wrap your head around what it looks like. And so we considered these things on Sunday morning. And then we launched into this passage here for this church that was at odds with each other, a church that was not bearing up with each other, a church that had division and pride. The Lord wanted to give them a lesson and how to really truly express and to see God's love and God's charity functioning in their lives. Now look with me, would you please, verse 4 of 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Charity suffereth long and is kind. And we gave a, a simple and short definition to each of these last Sunday evening. Suffereth long, it is long-tempered, it has a long fuse, it's not looking to be quickly irritated, it's not looking to have buttons pushed seemingly we live in a world today that is full of resentment and full of anger. A world today that is seemingly seeking revenge. And we have even projected other people's problems and other people's issues. We're projecting them now generations later into our relationships. And it causes people to be at odds with each other unnecessarily. Charity is not looking. Not looking for things to be irritated about. God is gracious and God is long-suffering and God is forbearing. How we need to be careful in this. A fallen world has words and looks and attitudes. And they stir us. And all around us we can be stirred and how we need to be cautious. Notice this, charity suffereth long and is kind, actively kind, courteous, good, helpful, useful, giving, showing favor, looking to be different, looking to make a difference, seeing someone in need and helping them, seeing someone in the parking lot loading up something heavy in the back of their vehicle and stopping and saying, could I help you with that? Seeing someone stranded or seeing a neighbor having difficulty and taking time to meet that need, looking to be kind, looking to be gracious in situations when others are not, not looking to escalate things, not looking to further one's own opinion or one's own right in particular areas, not, but looking rather to be helpful and to diffuse things, a soft answer turneth away wrath. That doesn't mean that we get walked over. It doesn't mean we don't know where we're supposed to stand. That's certainly not who the Lord Jesus in his testimony was. It's certainly not who the Apostle Paul was. But we also know that there's a time and there are situations where we're called to have a demeanor of certain stature. And then there are other times where we're called to simply, as the Lord did, he turned his, the other cheek. He wouldn't answer them. They reviled him, and he what? He reviled them not again. Stephen, a good type of this. Boy, was Stephen treated unfairly? Absolutely, but Stephen was being treated unfairly and unjustly as he was doing the will of God. And you may be called upon at times as you're doing the will of God to suffer persecution, and when you do, suffer it the right way. What are you about? Why are you involved in that? If it's for love of God and then in loving God that directs me to love those around me and to help them, then it may be that God brings me through a difficult thing for that testimony of simply being kind in the midst of a 
storm. That may be very well what God seeks to bring out of that. Consider Joseph. Joseph, whose own brothers sold him off. And Joseph, who went through so many things. And yet, even through all of that, Joseph had an excellent spirit. And God used that. Envieth not. Does not ask, why them? What about me? But rather, God, I'll take what you have for me, and I'll be happy for what you're doing for them. Vaunteth not itself. If envy is looking at others and wanting what they have, then vaunting is projecting myself to be something and to have something so that others would want what I've got. It's not puffed up. Four times the church of Corinth was addressed for being puffed up, to be prideful, to be arrogant, to be conceited, to be full of self like a bullfrog. Don't talk to me like that. Who do you think you are to correct me? Who do you think you are to try to point me in a different direction? Quickly, uh, quickly uh, defending self and self's positions, not being teachable. La charity here described does not behave unseemly, rudely, unmannerly, disgracefully. Follow along. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly a graciousness, a pleasantness, not returning back what we're being given. I heard a story of a little girl who had a dog, and the dog was growling at her, and so she got down on all fours and began to growl back at the dog. I don't know what the dog was thinking, but I know what the parent was thinking, and that was, you're acting like a dog. That's not going to fix anything. And there are times in life when we begin to growl back and as God's people, I don't know what we're thinking. We're not fixing anything. We're just simply acting like those that are around us. And we're called to follow in his steps. And that particular passage deals with the Lord's steps during a time of suffering, dealing with difficult things. Then we come to our new point here today. Look with me, would you please? And we'll go to verse 5. Doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own. Seeketh not her own, is not self-consumed. Do we not battle today in the culture that we're living in, self-consuming? We have something called a selfie. It used to be when you got your picture taken, it was because somebody wanted to take your picture. You wonder, why is it that your parents don't have very many pictures of you? It's because cameras were more expensive back then and film. Remember when you take pictures and drop them off to be developed? It was quite the process. And now what can you do? Any moment, at any time, you can take a picture, or even if you want to, take a picture of yourself. I'm not knocking you if you've done it, but I have to tell you, when you think about it, and sometimes, not only do we take them of ourselves, but then we doctor them up. <laughs> now, when you used to drop your pictures off at Walmart, or how many of you ever mailed pictures in? You mailed the film in, and then it came back to you. There was no doctoring. And what we would say back then was, bad lighting. <laughs> yeah, that was, that's, and now, man, we can just tune it in. And boy, it's shocking to me. Because occasionally I'll do business with folks and they'll have a picture that they've posted of what they look like. Now, mind you, if they want to put one, leave one up for five or ten years, that's one thing. Oh, you look older. I mean, young, I, I don't know what you look like. But I've seen folks that have posted one recently and then you meet them. It, would, they, would the right person please show up here? I mean, come on, this does, this does not pass the cost mustard. I'm, I'm picking at you a little bit. But you know, the, the point is, we have become quite self-absorbed. Right? You know, Lord Jesus said in the Gospel of Matthew, and there's, I think, several applications to this verse, but in gist, he said, you know, if a person's really going to find their life, they've got to lose it first. And they've got to lose it for the right reasons, for my purposes and for my cause. If you really want to experience living, then you've got to lose that self-mind and live for the Lord. And you find out what life and what real quality of life is all about. That's not what we're taught today. That's not the presentation of things. It's live for self. 
You hear these statements like this, you deserve it. You've earned it. Do you know what I deserve? I deserve a devil's hell. You know what I've earned? That's what I've earned. It's only by the grace of God that I'm not consumed, right? Everything that I've got in life, each and every day, in health, my being, my life, my existence, is all because of God and God's goodness. Well, we need to shake the world's mindset of being self-absorbed. Charity seeketh not her own, is not self-consumed. Does not look to be served, but rather to serve. Looks to give and not to receive. Isn't consistently saying, You're, that, this is my right. You're infringing on me. You're taking advantage of me. Seeketh not her own. If I could for a moment, as I see in my mind's eye, a manger. And I see a little baby being brought into the world. And I hear some angels who have sung to shepherds. I see something above a manger. Seeketh not her own. Everything about 1 Corinthians chapter 13, you can interject the name of Jesus in there. Christ suffereth long. Christ is kind. Christ vaunteth not. Christ is not puffed up. Christ seeketh not his own. Now, I don't mean he's not seeking his own in that sense, but the Lord Jesus laid aside uh, the royalty, in a sense, and stepped out of heaven and came to this earth and made himself of no reputation. He didn't enter in uh, in honor. He entered in in humility. All to be an example to us, because for you and I, if we could pick and project what that would look like, it would be the greatest entrance that has ever happened. Consider when your babies were born, or consider when a grandchild was born. You wanted the whole world to know about it. Oh, beaming from ear to ear. I remember riding up the elevator and going there, and people are just looking at me, and I'm telling them, we, yep, we had a baby. Like the whole world to know. Right? A photographer comes by, would you like pictures of the baby? Absolutely, how much do they cost? <laughs> no, that's not what you asked. It might have been what I asked, but that's not what you asked. Yeah, of course we want pictures of the baby. What a big entrance, what the world to know. The Lord Jesus came in humbly. Seeketh not her own. Consider his ministry. Consider the example of who he was and how he went about and his attitude and his disposition and serving. I call his, the manger, his ministry, and then his masterpiece. Consider the masterpiece, the passion of the Lord Jesus Christ. Consider what he endured. Consider all that was said to him. Consider all the actions. Consider all the raw human emotions that were thrown at him. The very things that bother us to the core. Rejection being falsely accused, being misunderstood, uh, being betrayed, having those that love you forsake you, everything that you and I might look to in our human experience and say, these are some of the worst things that have ever happened to me. They were poured out on Christ. But there's that mindset, seeketh not our own. And we through life, have our issues and we through life have our difficulties and how often do we retreat and hide behind those difficult times and those issues rather than saying, you know what, I'm done making it about me. I'm done making it about me. I want to make my life about him. We have hurts. We all have past and failures in our past. We all have people that have wronged us and people that if we allowed it to, could be a chain to us and hold us and keep us back from going forward. But a part of that is seeking our own. A part of that is self-centeredness. A part of that is me and being consumed with me and how I've been handled and how I've been treated. But charity, a life of giving and a God love, does not seek own, but looks to do what? To go forward in a right way in service and looking for others. I'm reminded of this statement regarding the Lord Jesus Christ. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Would have been sufficient for the Lord to come into the world, go to the cross, take the burden, take the sin, the punishment for sin in his body for us. Would have been sufficient. But that's not what he did. He came into the earth. 
He walked amongst men for all those years. He ministered to men. He cared for them. And then he allowed mankind, the very men that he would come to save, uh, to handle him in such a rough fashion. He came to do what? Not just to save, but also to do what? To seek. His life was a life of seeking. His life was a life of teaching. It's one thing for us to say today, we'd like for the world to know Christ and to be saved, but what do we seek? Seek ye first the kingdom of God. What are you seeking today? Who are you living for today? Where do you find satisfaction and joy in life today? Is your joy and your happiness in life based on self and based on where you project or you have projected or where you see your life at? Or do you find tremendous levels of dissatisfaction because you're not getting out of life what you want from it? Charity, according to the scripture, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked. Oftentimes when we make life about self, all these things of being puffed up and behaving unseemly and vaunting and all of that comes right back to that self, self, self. Not easily provoked. Speaks of having a short fuse. Are you provoked easily? Are you on edge? Does it take very little for you to be set off? Does it take very little for you to be done with somebody? Does somebody simply get one time with you? They said one thing you didn't like. They looked at you one way you didn't like, and you were done with them. A preacher said something in a sermon. He could say oh, 10,000 words that were good, but said five words you didn't like. And that's it. He's a bad preacher. I don't listen to him again. A church member can be faithful and be good and gracious to everybody in the room, but they have a run-in or an encounter with you, and you wrote them off. You're looking. Looking for a reason to write people off. You work with somebody, and you're looking for a reason to be done with them. You're looking for a reason to be at odds with them. You're looking for a reason to be offended. I think they're talking about me. You think. Now listen, they may very well be. And if that's the case, that's unfortunate that they have nothing better to talk about. But who cares? The largest percentage of time is they're not talking about you. You're allowing the enemy to put it that way, and you're looking for a reason. You're looking for something to provoke you. Do you find yourself at the gas station getting easily provoked? Do you find yourself thinking you long for the days when a gas station was just that? Not a tobacco shop, liquor shop, lottery spot. Can I just pay for my gas? Fortunately, I'm thankful for pay at the pump. Amen? Until it doesn't work. How many of you paid at the pump and it didn't work? Then you went to the other side and it didn't work. And then you thought to yourself, God is love. <laughs> hmm? God is love. No, we get, hey. We live in a world, we're touching the world. My feet are on the ground. The priests, before they could go into the tabernacle, they walked in, and what was the first thing they walked by? It's an item that we're not even given the, the size, the dimension of it. We just know what it's made out of. The mirrors and the glass that they collected on their way out of Egypt, that was that wash basin. Because the priests would have to come, before they could go on with things, they would wash off real good and wash off their feet and get the defilements of the world off of them. We're touching the world. We're interacting in a world that's full of hostility and frustration and contempt and envy and it gets on us and boy, it becomes so easy for us to be like that little girl growling back at the dog. What we need to do is what? Be washed by the Word of God. Be clean. And purposely choose. I choose to love as God loves. I choose this. That familial love, that connection. Nobody had to tell me to love my family. It came natural to me. That's natural. That friendship, I love that Philadelphia love. And we have those friends that we've got things in common with. And we like that. And it's easy. How many of you have a friend that's easy to love? How many of you have people in your life that aren't so easy to love? And we choose to love them. And God has chose us. Suffer long. Seeketh not her own, not easily provoked. Look at this next expression of this. Thinketh no evil. 
thinketh no evil. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, and thinketh no evil. Well, we live in a world today where evil abounds all around us. Perhaps this is telling us that in this matter of thinking no evil, that when there is this God love for people, this charity love, this giving love for others, that we're not looking to find evil in them. We're hoping, and I believe it bears out, that it's not the case. That our minds are not fixed on that. That our minds are fixed on good things and pure things. Perhaps it speaks to not being resentful or not being grudgingly holding on to evil things. I'm not real good with computers, but I know just enough to function. And I have this thing called email. How many of you have an email address? I know that for some strange reason, the junk mail that I still get in my regular mailbox, now I'm getting, I get junk mail in my email mailbox. And so because of that, I'm not so great at checking it, right? And sometimes I look at it and I'll go through it. If I really want to keep something, I have learned to flag my email. How many of you know how to flag an email? I'm on my way. I'm going to make it before I die. I'll flag it. Now I'll keep it there, right? And then there's that name, that person that sent something to you. Then when you get tired of looking at that, it, that's called being where? In your inbox. How many of you have no idea what I'm talking about? Stay in the dark. You're better off, all right? Your inbox. You have so many unread messages, and that's my inbox. Then when you move something from your inbox, it goes to a little can called the trash. But it's still there, right? It's just in the trash. So it's kind of like at home when you ate McDonald's on the way home and you weren't really supposed to eat McDonald's on the way home and you take the bag and you get out of your vehicle and you go to the trash can on the outside of the house not the one on the not that you would ever have done this before and you put it in the trash can that's technically on the property but not necessarily going to be directly under people's inspection you put that bag of McDonald's in there it's gone, but it's not really gone. It's not gone until Thursday morning <laughs> when the trash truck comes down the street and picks it up and dumps it in, and now it's kind of gone, right? But occasionally what happens to some might be that somebody else in the house might go to the trash can to put something else in there and might see a McDonald's wrapper there. And then the question may be, I see why you weren't so hungry. <laughs> and this is when we say, charity suffereth long. <laughs> right? So I got an inbox. Right? I got trash and then I get it deleted. Thinketh no evil. For some of us, we carry in our inbox things and resentments towards people. Then we take them and we Maybe we get tired of it enough where we put it in the trash, but it's still there. I heard a preacher tell about another preacher who had a fella come to him and he said, Sir, I need help with my wife. She's historical. And the preacher said, I think you're wrong. It's, she's not historical. She's hysterical. And he said, No, 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 no. She's historical. She brings up everything that's ever happened. And there are men who are like that as well. It's not just a lady thing. Right? Sometimes with people, we carry around in our thinking evil. We leave it in the inbox. Then maybe we drop it in the trash. We don't bring it. The inbox you see all the time. The trash you only bring out on special occasions. How about this today? How about in those areas that maybe we carry that issue why don't we just let the Lord Jesus help us to put it in the trash and then be hauled away? Well, that doesn't mean I walk through life ignorantly. It doesn't mean I walk through life without knowledge or understanding of situations or people. But I'm not going to spend my, if I wanted to, I could spend my entire life thinking evil towards people. I could find a reason, and you could find a reason as well, with somebody to be irritated, aggravated, or put off. Somebody you work alongside them, they get under your skin. You ever worked with somebody, you got to where you couldn't even stand the sound of their voice. Here they go again. I worked with a gal, bless her heart. 
She started every phone conversation out with this. Where are you at? Where are you at? Now, in that particular work relationship, I happened to be uh, the person who was responsible for everybody, okay? And so she was not responsible for me. I was responsible for her. And the person who owned it had structured it that way. But bless her heart. I would hear her. She'd call me. And I'd be honest with you, that just... There's one... There's two ladies in this world who can ask me that. My mom, by birth, I guess just it happens, right? And I'm married to somebody who has that right as well to say where you're at. By the way, fellas, if your wife asks you where you're at, she's got a right to ask you where you're at. You're one flesh. Ladies, likewise. But I was not born by that woman, and I was not married to that woman. And after a while, I heard her, she talked to everybody, her husband and everybody. It wasn't just me or him, it was just who she was. And finally I said to her politely, don't ever ask me that again. If I want you to know where I'm at, I'll start the conversation with that. Hello, I'm at such and such place. Right? Oh, I'd see her call come through and just her voice would make me not want to answer the telephone. Now, you would never be like that, would you? Has anybody ever worked with somebody that really got under your skin that way? Huh? Yeah. Oh. Anybody have a neighbor like that? Anybody have a life like that? Boy, and that really gets in that cooker, man. It just sits there. And you know who that eats up? That, hurts up? that eats up you. That person may not even realize it, and they may realize it. If they don't realize it, you're wasting your breath. And if they do realize it, they're an obnoxious person, and you ought to just simply pray that the Lord would help them to do better. Thinketh no evil. Notice this one with me, would you please? And we'll bring things to a close today. Doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in what? In iniquity. Does not take pleasure in sin or even in passing it on or the communication of it of passing it on. Does not find satisfaction when people fail is not pleased to hear when somebody's gotten themselves in trouble. They're grieved by that. It bothers them. It hurts them. They're not happy in that. They don't make light of that. I believe that one of the problems in our world today is we do not have the right response and attitude towards iniquity. Sin should really bother us. Sin should grieve us. We have allowed ourselves to be entertained in a way that is not conducive to righteousness. That's not, look, look, with your children, you love your children. You don't glamorize or project wrong things as being good or pleasurable. If you do, you're making a mistake. We don't rejoice in iniquity. Why? We recognize the problems and the complications that iniquity brings. We don't want that for people because we love them. That grieves us. We don't rejoice when we hear that somebody has fallen in iniquity. We don't laugh about that. We're grieved by that. We're not looking to pass that on. David, for example, when Jonathan and Saul died in battle because of Saul's disobedience to God. And there were people in Israel who were behind David. They were excited for David now would be his time to be king. And they were publishing it. They were telling the whole world, Saul and Jonathan are dead. And David said to them, Publish it not in Gath. Don't make light of this. Our society today runs from one work of iniquity to the next work of iniquity. We glamorize it so much, I'm concerned that even people who are already struggling mentally, they see that in desires for a little bit of attention. They do crazy, ignorant things just so they would be noticed. Our news feed goes to things. And I understand that there's a, a point of knowing what's happening around you and being alert and being aware. But man, could we, get a good, could we get a good dose of something every once in a while? This shooting and that shooting and this happening and that taking place. And those things are happening. But there are other things that are happening too that are good. I remember years ago, in our local newspaper, which is 
usually just about good for lining the bottom of your birdcage with, right? All the silliness, and you look at the newspaper, and sometimes some of the stuff they put in them is just ridiculous. And I called, and I said, hey, we're going to be honoring uh, survivors of the USS Indianapolis. And we're going to have one. He's, going to, he's a preacher. He's going to come, and he's going to preach for us, and we're going to have all these folks here with us. And I said, I think it'd be an excellent story. I think it'd be an excellent piece. I think it'd be something really worthwhile for your newspaper to put in it. Yeah, they didn't put it in the newspaper. That's not to say that some wouldn't and some have. I mis don't mistake that. But in that particular occasion, no. And I remember looking at the paper that week on purpose to see what they did put in there. And it was nonsensical. When there was something really worth talking about. You know, in your church life, if you want to, you can spend a lot of time rejoicing in iniquity. Because we are working with fallen people. Everywhere I go, there are fallen people. There is sin all around us. If we choose to make light of it, if we choose to dwell there, if we choose to look for the negative and the, the bad, if we choose to, to pick and to really to choose, so to speak, what we spend our time in, you're going to absolutely positively run yourself into the ground. But I want to remind you of something. There is a God in heaven, and He's still working, and He is still doing good things. People are still getting saved. People are growing in grace. People are staying married. Children are being raised right. There are a lot of good things happening. There are people who are still looking to serve other people and to love other people. And I, I, I think at the very least, you ought to at least interject some of that in your thinking there instead of spending all of your time in the bleak and in the bad. We have television shows, how to get away with murder. And then we wonder, why are people murdering people at an alarming rate? We give games to children with controllers and in the game, they're a shooter. We have games they sell by the millions of people hijacking automobiles. That's the game. The game is to hijack automobiles and then to run from the police. And then we wonder why car theft and hijacking and robbing is on the rise. Why? We rejoice. We take pleasure in iniquity. It entertains us. And this is not charity. God looked upon the violence leading up to the flood, and God didn't like it. God was not pleased with it. God was not pleased that the actions and even the hearts and the thoughts of men were angled towards that. And as a society, the more we go along with that, the more we applaud that, the more we pay for that, the more we'll get of that. Boy, we're going to finish this tonight on this matter, but boy, as I look at these things about not being easily provoked and not thinking evil and inbox, trash, delete, getting stuff out of my life and out of my thinking and towards others perhaps and even towards my past as I look at this about rejoicing in iniquity. I said, boy, we, as God's people, we've got a lot of room to grow in the matter of having love like God, don't we? We are in a time where I think seemingly, increasingly, people are becoming without natural affection. But I think also it could be said just as it was with the church in Corinth. We're losing sight of why God, if you would, has gifted us. And that is that we would be vessels to do what? To express and to demonstrate the love of God. The love of God is caught as much as it's taught. Jesus, and I closed last Sunday night with this, and I'll close with it again. Jesus said to his disciples, by this shall all men know, this will be your badge, that you're my disciples. And then he, he did things. He washed their feet. What was he doing in washing their feet? He was saying, hey, catch this. Catch this. This is more than me just telling you something. This is me showing you something. Catch this. Catch this love. Catch this charity, this giving, this not living for self. Philippians says what? Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of what? No reputation. Went so far as to, make, to take on the form of a servant and became obedient even unto the death of the cross. Let no man seek his own, but every man another. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Hereby perceive we the love of God. Because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. 
Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, we come to you now considering your great love. We know this because you displayed it. You showed it for all the world to see. And God, no one will go into a crisis eternity without having to know and to realize that God loved them and God gave His Son for them. Lord, if we today, Your people, are to be effective, if we're going to be more than just noisemakers, if we're going to be more than just people of knowledge, if we're going to be more than just people of sacrifice, we've got to recognize the love that you have and the love that's within us in the person of the Holy Spirit and allow that to be developed. God, forgive us where we've failed you, for certainly, Lord, we have at points. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. If you're here this morning and you would say, Preacher, I do not know for sure that if I were to die today that heaven would be my home. Perhaps you have a problem with love because you've not experienced the forgiveness of God's love and salvation. If you're here today and you'd say, Preacher, I don't know that I'm saved, please pray for me. Would you raise your hand, anyone like that at all? You'd say, Preacher, I don't know for sure if I were to die today that heaven would be my home. Please, Pastor, pray for me. Would you lift your hand? If you're here this morning and say, Preacher, I know that I'm saved, but I need to grow and have God's love developed in my life, and I desire that. Preacher, please pray with me as the Lord stirs my heart today in this matter of God's love. Would you raise your hand? I might pray with you. Would say that, Preacher, something in that for me. Here in just a moment, we're going to have an invitation. We have a young man who's received the Lord Jesus Christ as his Savior. He's going to follow the Lord in believers' baptism this morning. We rejoice in that. If you've been saved and not yet scripturally baptized, we encourage you to come forward as well and let others communicate with you in this. And Lord, we would ask today that the Lord would have free reign in our lives. Perhaps there's a, an area, as we've considered this matter of charity,